One of the most dramatic ways that pathogens express their own agenda is the rapid evolution of resistance to antibiotics. These resistant infections kill thousands of people every year, and they are much more expensive to treat than non-resistant infections. Modern surgery depends on effective antibiotics, and if we lose effective antibiotics because resistance becomes commonplace, then surgery is going to become much more difficult and much riskier for the patient. Furthermore, the drug pipeline that produces antibiotics is drying up. There aren't that many new antibiotics coming down the pike. This is actually a very serious problem. But let's put a few things in perspective. Here on the x-axis, we have time running from 1900 to about 1990. Here we have the mortality rate per 100,000 people per year. This big spike here is the 1918 flu epidemic. This is in the United States, okay? Sulfonamids came in about here, and penicillin came in about here. Down here we have a little uptick due to HIV. So when we look at it in this perspective, we can see that in fact, most of the reduction in the mortality rate had already occurred before the introduction of antibiotics. And if we lose antibiotics, then we're likely to go back to about this level of mortality rate per 100,000 per year. Now, it, mind you, that's still a lot higher than it currently is, and it's not nice, but it's not as bad as things were in the 19th century. So what are these antibiotics anyway? Well. They are many different kinds of molecules that interfere with bacterial growth. Many of them occur naturally. Many of them actually are produced by bacteria and fungi, and that's important because bacteria and fungi have been around for a long time, which means that antibiotic resistance has had a long time to evolve. The way that we produce them is often to take a naturally occurring antibiotic and to modify it. And some antibiotics are fully synthetic, and they may have no natural counterpart. So it's a heterogeneous group of things. Now, how do they work? Well, they work in a number of ways, but they mainly work by mimicking a critical molecule, by binding to an active site irreversibly, or by competing with some naturally occurring mo molecule for binding or for passage or for transport. So basically, they go into bacterial metabolism at an important point, and they mess it up. The object is to slow the growth or to kill the bacteria. A therapeutic antibiotic that you use in a human needs to do this with minimal toxicity in the host. And this is usually accomplished by picking out some feature of the bacterium or the virus, which is unique to bacteria and viruses and which doesn't occur in eukaryotes. Now, that's why anti-helminthic drugs are often so toxic. Helminths are worms. They're eukaryotes. Their cells are very much like our cells. If we want to poison a worm, we have to do it in a way that is very likely also to be poisoning the human. And so basically, worm therapy is a case of trying to kill the worm before you kill the patient. Many antibiotics evolved in the soil environment, okay, and that's where there's a tremendous amount of coevolution going on among bacteria and fungi to inhibit competitors and things like that. It's been going on for billions of years. And if you just take a sample out of the soil and plate it out, you get a lot of diversity. And you can see, for example, where this little ring here is on the plate, that whatever is growing here is killing everything that might want to attack it. That's been cleared. Here's another example right here. If you then isolate one strain from here and plate it out onto basically a lawn of bacteria, you can see antibiotic being produced by each of these isolates. Okay, so antibiotics evolved a long time ago, and resistance to antibiotics evolved a long time ago and in places far, far away. Why is that important? It's important because of horizontal transfer. 
essentially a huge library of information on how to resist antibiotics exists out there in nature. Horizontal transfer means that one bacterium can take that information, that library, and give it to another bacterium. It can do it either through bacterial sex or mediated by a virus that jumps between them, or it can do it just by having some of its DNA out in the soil after it dies and gets eaten by another bacterium. This is the result. Here is a cassette of antibiotic resistance genes in Salmonella typhimurium. And you can see that it's got genes that cause resistance to streptomycin, spectinomycin, chloramphenicol, fluorphenicol, tetracycline, gentamicin, and so forth. And they're all lined up next to each other, which means that this whole unit of genetic information can be clipped out and handed to another bacterium. How rapidly does antibiotic resistance evolve? Well, it evolves very rapidly. As a matter of fact, when Alexander Fleming first isolated penicillin, he picked up resistance to penicillin in his lab within six months. Penicillin was released much more broadly in 1943. Resistance was observed two years later. Chloramphenicol released in 1949, resistance in 1950, and so forth. Every time we, resist, we release a new antibiotic, resistance to it evolves. A study done in the UK indicated that if a new antibiotic is released in the UK, resistance will evolve in the UK in about six months, and in the modern global environment, it will arrive in Hong Kong within two years. So it spreads around the world. A good example is Staphylococcus, and we call methicillin-resistant staph, MRSA, okay? You can also think of it as multiply resistant staph. Staphylococcus evolved resistance to penicillin four years after it became commercially available. It evolved resistance to methicillin after methicillin was used. That took a couple of decades. There was then a switch to vancomycin. Within about five or six years, resistance evolved to vancomycin. Linozolids were introduced, and two years later, resistance to linozolids was reported. So, this is now becoming a very threatening kind of bacterium. So the concept I've been trying to imply is that we discover and deploy a new antibiotic, resistance evolves, we go back, we try to discover another one, resistance evolves. That is called the antibiotic treadmill or the drug-bug coevolutionary arms race. In the case of amoxicillin, Amoxicillin cost about four to twenty-four dollars to treat a patient. Resistance evolved. Then clavulinic acid and augmentin was added as an augmentin, and that cost about sixty-four to one hundred and seventy-two dollars. And then re resistance evolved to that. So not only does resistance evolve, but it gets more expensive to treat patients. The cost of treating antibiotic resistance for Staph A in hospital in infections when it was penicillin resistant was about two to seven billion. When it became methicillin resistant, it was about eight billion. For community acquired staph infections, it's about 14 to 21 billion. The overall cost of treating staph is somewhere between 25 and 35 billion dollars a year. If we look at something like AIDS, then we have to ask ourselves, why does treating AIDS cost so much? And the answer is that the initial drug that was so effective against AIDS, AZT, was something that uh, HIV evolved resistance to very quickly. And so we are now dependent upon drug cocktails, and those cocktails cost on the order of ten to $15,000 per year per patient. So resistance is expensive. Why is it so rampant? Why is it so ubiquitous? Well, antibiotics are overused, they're misused, they are misprescribed, and they are used in agriculture. They shouldn't be used for viral infections, but they often are. Here is a breakdown of unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions by infection type. So the unnecessary ones for ear infections, about 30%. For colds, 100%. For bronchitis, 80%. Sore throats, half. And sinusitis, half. So there's overprescription. And 
The reasons for this, I think, are worth thinking about. Basically, these are often pediatricians interacting with anxious parents, and they are using antibiotics as a way of controlling parent psychology rather than viral infection. When we look at where antibiotics are used, about half are used in humans and about half in agriculture. Most of the ones used in humans are out in the community, about 20% in hospitals. About, 20, about a quarter to half of that is probably unnecessary. In agriculture, about 20% is therapeutic to deal with some agricultural problem, and about 80% is to speed up the growth of whatever it is, a pig or a calf or a chicken. And a great deal of that is highly questionable. There are about 25 million pounds of antibiotics per year that are added to animal feed. And that's for growth enhancement. And these doses are subtherapeutic. And the fact that they're subtherapeutic, which means that they don't completely clear out the infection, enhances the evolution of resistance. Now, how can we avoid or delay resistance evolution? Well, we can reduce the infection rate. That would mean that we avoid things like undercooked eggs and meat and we wash hands. That's probably a very good way. We limit the use of antibacterial soaps and cleaners because they are subtherapeutic. They basically exert strong selection for the evolution of resistance without killing off all the bacteria. We can stop prescribing antibiotics for viral infections, and we can eliminate antibiotic use in animal feed, which would, of course, cause the agricultural lobby to scream. These approaches are only partially effective for psychological, political, and economic reasons. We can modify drugs, or we can discover new drugs, so that gets us back onto the drug treadmill. There are very few new classes of drugs that have been discovered in the last decade. Drug discovery costs an enormous amount in time and dollars. Many candidates fail because they're actually toxic to the patient. And as soon as we release them, resistance evolves fairly quickly. So although this is a standard big pharma approach, it is a strategy that seems to be failing. So to summarize, microbial pathogens rapidly evolve resistance, especially in emergency rooms and intensive care units. Nosocomial infections, that is, infections that are acquired in the hospital, the patient didn't have it when the patient went in, but they got the infection in the hospital. That kind of infection of a multiply resistant pathogen is currently killing more patients each year than breast cancer and HIV combined in the United States. The genes for resistance often evolved a long time ago and far away from any interaction with human beings. There's a vast library of information on bacterial resistance out there in the soil. Every new drug becomes ineffective within a few years, and the drug discovery pipeline is drying up. Evolution-proof therapies offer some hope, and we're going to take a look at them.